The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts, that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 19. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation." These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one. Everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Word of God, word of light. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. The second reading is from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have, have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that sufferings and produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through our Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God. Word of God. Gospel according to Matthew, the ninth chapter. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When Jesus saw the crowds, 
He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to the disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out the demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff, or for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or will listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you'll be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, don't worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not you who will speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all of the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of our Lord. That sounds like a nice long lesson, a nice long lecture on Father's Day, a good, you know, story to remind us of all the things uh, our fathers, our earthly fathers tried to teach, and you just had to sit there and listen. One of my favorite lessons my dad taught me, who's been gone since uh, 1985, I was 18 when he died, um, I can still remember the saying that he used to say, Do as I say. Really? You've heard that sermon, huh? What is it? Do as I say. Not. Now, I thought that was a kind of a shrewd statement as I think back. Kind of this person who, as I think about not being a perfect man, uh, understood the difference between aspiring values and operational values. An aspiring value is this is what we should be shooting for. An operational value is, yeah, uh, we don't live up to that. Um, I just saw a child I baptized, I know I'm getting old, Uh, I saw a kid I baptized at Synod Assembly yesterday from Living Waters, and um, she told me she still had the dollar bill I gave from First Communion class. And she goes, I have it in my youth Bible. 
And I said, ah, you used to, that's how I used to teach kids to be grateful. I'd give them a dollar and wait for a response. And the response is, thank you. That's the response when you receive a gift. And I said, and I said, hi, your parents. And she goes, oh, they're, they're overseas on a vacation. And I go, how are they? And she goes, oh, you know, you know, they're crabby. Imagine teenagers saying their parents are crabby. Shrewd, um, maybe not so gentle as they think about it. But she but I said, do you remember in First Communion class when I said to parents, do your kids ever make mistakes? And parents would always say, yeah. Now, the kids' response, and I asked uh, Casey this, I go, and when I said to the kids, do your parents ever make mistakes? Do you know the response for the kids? Every time I've asked that question, the volume is so much louder than the parents' response about their children. I'm not sure what that's about. But I think about these lessons parents teach. And I think about my dad and how shrewd he was about some of the lessons and the struggles he had as a man who only had a ninth grade education, struggled with issues of providing for nine children, living in Cabrini Green, a housing project for three years in the difficult times of the early 60s, and then being raised uh, in that family family of nine. Exactly, struggling with brothers and sisters always talking over me. Um, So I I think about that aspect of the difference between being shrewd and gentle. As Jesus says in today's gospel lesson in regards to the disciples' call to minister out into the world. Jesus says you must be, uh, some translations say shrewd, some translations say wise. Wise sounds like you know, you're just supposed to, with wisdom, you know, knowledge or a sense of knowing what's right and wrong. But the sense of shrewdness is the same term used in Matthew 7, where Jesus says, the wise man built his house on the, the foolish man built his house on the, the wise one was a Cub fan, the foolish one was a, no, a Packer fan, there you go. No, I mean, it's shrewd, like you know that waves are going to come. You know that there's going to be storms. You you know that people uh, and all of us have operational values that are not always rooted in what God wants and what God's call to us is. Jesus knew the difference between the operational values and the aspiring values of the people of God. He saw that they had been laboring and burdened by this idea that if they kept the commands, they could be self-justified. They knew what it was like when Jesus hears the Old Testament's message today, when they come out of Egypt, out of 400 years of slavery, and they see how great God is, and Moses says, this is what God said, he wants to set you apart to be a nation blessing to all the world, and the people say, Sort of like everything that the Lord said we'll do, okay? You know, we see it. There's that sense of the awesome fear and power of God. And there's a covenant that is created in this beginning of this relationship at Sinai. And the covenant is, I will do this for you, but you will do this for me. It's an if you do this, I will bless you. And then the Levitical laws of the Old Testament Remind people that if you, don't do, if you break this command, this is the sacrificial part of your keeping this command. You have to sacrifice. There's this whole system. And the sense of righteous, self-righteous and justifying is this hundreds and hundreds of years of feeling and living in this covenant where they know they broke the covenant. And God's faithfulness comes back to them again and again and again. And they're living under that system, the, the temple system of having to justify yourself. And Jesus is, before he sends the disciples out, he teaches them and tells them about God's goodness. And then he also sets them free for life. He heals. He sets the blind free. Anybody who's possessed by some type of of force, prevailing force that tells them who they think they are, out of life, 
Jesus is setting them free from who they think they have to be. Jesus knows these people have been unable to keep the covenant and comes to them as we hear in Romans. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not an if then. It's because God loves them so much and us. God loves these people so much. Jesus is saying, no matter what you do, you are forgiven. He has great compassion for he sees all of these people as sheep without a shepherd. And then the message of this this value, aspiring value of what Christ calls the disciples to do, he sets them out into the world. He calls them to do two things. He calls them to proclaim the good news of God's grace and mercy. And then he calls them to rebuke the spirits that work against God's will. To rebuke the spirits, to offer people freedom from whatever possesses them, whatever messages they are living with from the prevailing forces of the culture. Jesus is saying in, to the disciples to rebuke those voices. Now we often think of that kind of demon possession as this sort of like exorcist movie where heads turn and you know people vomit and all this kind of the demonium that is real. But we also know that there's this reality of the voices of grief and struggle, of what I think I and who I must be, whatever pains and struggles that are in, in my life, that this defines me and I have to do something to overcome this. These forces, prevailing forces about who we think we are or who as a church we are. We, are, we have this aspiring value to be a mosaic community. But we have an operational value that we know we fall short. We're called again to rebuke the forces that define what and who we are as people. The voices based in generations of privilege, in generations of work ethic that places people's value not on being called through the water and the word of God's promises, but upon the other forces and voices in the world. We aspire to be wise and shrewd, but often we are foolish. And Jesus says you must be shrewd as a serpent and wise as a dove. Good news sets us free. Calls us then to rebuke any spirits that makes you think your heavenly father doesn't love you. Whatever unclean spirits are binding you, we're called today by the spirit in Jesus' name to rebuke that. When you name something and you speak it out loud and you tell somebody it, you're giving the one who has control and power over all authority, over all spirits, Jesus, to put them in their place and to walk now in freedom. Amen. This week, you may have heard that Zion and many other churches have begun the participation in the Rockford Housing Authority's program called Family to Family. Churches are being paired up with a resident of the new uh, place out on Newtown, the Grove, uh, to enter into a companion relationship. We're not going to do anything for people. Because we live by that old motto, what you do for somebody without them, you do to them. Say that with me. Whatever you do for somebody, you do we're walking together in this new companion relationship toward a life that says our community is going to aspire to being for all people. And that we're going to rebuke the spirit which says that blacks and whites cannot live in community together. That people who are rich and middle class and poor cannot learn to live in community 
that we rebuke the spirit that says the poor will always be in the ghettos and leave them there, and we'll move farther and farther away in disinterest. We rebuke the spirit that hides us as a faith people. We rebuke them in Jesus' name that we may renounce those forces and aspire to preach good news and know that we've been set free from whatever forces that are prevailing against our life individually and communally. Because there are more forces that are going to work against God's message and we are called into community in Jesus' name to rebuke those voices and to proclaim the good news of hope that is ours in Christ. And since we are set free, we can rejoice knowing that we will struggle in this relationship. We will make mistakes still. But we're called by the one who says, do as I say and do as I do. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for your spirit that sets us free from anything in the past that binds us, that we may be called to the shores of your water in the font and in those promises where you claim us all as your children. We give you thanks that you are our Heavenly Father and that you continue to set us free. In Jesus' name, amen.